Good Friday service here at Logos. Whether you're in house or online, we want to welcome you in the name of the Lord. We want to invite you to stand up as we worship. Amen. Before we worship, though, we're going to open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for bringing us here, oh God. Lord, today we remember your suffering, oh God. Lord, today we remember what you did, oh God. Lord, why you came, oh God. Lord, it was all for this moment, oh God. And Lord, we've come to give you thanks, oh God. We've come to give you an offering of worship, oh God. Lord, that your name would be glorified, oh God. Father, we thank you, oh God, for what you've done, oh God. And we lift this service to you. And everybody said, in the mighty name of Jesus.
everything was completed. And he is to come. He is to come. Before we start, let us pray. Father, we come here today to remember a curse that was broken on a cross that was meant for the vilest criminals. You sent your son to die for us, to forgive us, to wash us clean, Lord, from everything that we've done. And Lord, to also call us home one day. For without the cross, there is no eternal home. Thank you, Lord. Praise be to you, O oh God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Thank you. One of the interesting things about the cross is the irony behind the cross. You see, in North America, the West, even around the world, we talk about freedom, having freedom. That freedom is so important. But you see, the cross actually represents true freedom. It's a freedom that has no definition in our understanding. In fact, the irony of the cross is how can something so vile that is meant for the worst of criminals be a deliverance for us? How can a cross that is the worst punishment of that time, and you've got to understand, the best equivalent we have here in, in uh, our society is in the south of the south in the states and they have the lethal injection they have you know the electric chair for the worst of offenders but the cross was far worse than that because the cross was actually designed to make you suffer and not only did Christ suffer he suffered on the way to the cross and hung on that cross suffering for you and I. But it wasn't God's plan. And so today, you may be asking the question, why? Why did God have to do it this way? Was it necessary? Was it necessary for the Christ to go to the cross? Well, when God created, he started off by saying, let there be light. And then he created everything that crawls, everything that walks on this earth. And then he created us. Genesis 1, 27, and then God created man in his own image. And he goes on to say, male and female. And at the end of creation in chapter 1, he says, and it was very good. It was very good. You see, God had intended a relationship with us that was unhindered, unimpaired. He had intended us to be in the Garden of Eden, in a place where there was no pain, no shame, no death. That was his intention. But you see, with love comes freedom. There is no such thing as love without freedom. Love must be freely taken and accepted. Otherwise, it isn't love. And so God didn't create us as robots. He wanted to love us, but he wanted to be loved back. And in order to do that, we had to freely be willing to love him back. 
And Satan knew this. And Satan, in his treachery, wanted to be like God, wanted to be independent from God, free from God, went down and tempted Adam and Eve. And the first thing that, that came out of, out of Satan's mouth, one of the first things is, did God actually say? Did God actually say? And to this day, Satan continues to trick you and I every day. Did God actually say? You can go ahead and do this, or you can go ahead and do that. And then he goes on further to to give us this concept of being like God, like we can be like God. He he said that to to Adam and Eve. You can be like God in verse 3. And Eve, she actually, if you notice in the scripture, she actually quoted God correctly. But it says in verse 6 that the fruit was a delight to her eyes. Do you see the symbolism of that? It wasn't just the fruit of the tree, but the fruit of being like God. The desire to be like God. Almost a twisted sense of freedom. To be able to do what I want, when I want, however I want it. Sound familiar? And so once they ate from the tree, it was the only thing that God asked them to do. And it's the one thing that they had to do with the treachery and the lie that they believed in. Once they saw how much bondage had fallen upon them, the shame that had fallen on them, they truly saw that there was no freedom. And so, God had a plan even from that moment in time, thousands of years ago. And he declared it in that chapter, it's recorded in the Bible, it says in verse 13, that while Satan would bruise his heel, in other words, Satan would bruise us, we would bruise his head or crush his head. And that was the prophetic statement that started a plan to reverse what was lost. And so to this day, we battle with the concept of, well, can we be like God? Can we be independent? Can we be free from God? And the battle goes on to this day. We'll create our own gods. We'll do our own thing. We'll create our own governments. We'll create our own society. Technology can do so much. We are free to live how we want, when we want. And we've even gotten to a point in society where we even have the right to define our own gender. Define how we want to live. What freedom. Wow. Such a freedom that so many people in our society go through so many things to try and achieve freedom that it's never enough. And then they think that by doing this, they'll achieve freedom and happiness. And then they keep going on and on and on. Maybe if I make a billion dollars, I'll be happy. No, that doesn't work. Maybe I'm not the gender I'm supposed to. Change my No, that doesn't work either. How much do we have to run from how God intended things to be? How far away must we run before we actually see the truth behind what God had intended? But see, God had a plan. (laughs) God had a plan. And his plan was actually to bring us back into freedom, a true freedom, a freedom where the, the weight of this world the weight of our mistakes, of the hurt and pain that we felt, of the hurt and pain that we've caused others, can be taken away. And one of the first signs of that plan we can see in Abraham. In chapter 22, Abraham and Isaac, you know, and this is after Abraham um, had had Isaac in in his late, late years, and 
the Lord calls him to go and sacrifice with Isaac. And so he goes, he goes on this journey. And as they're going, you know, they're getting everything ready, and, and Abraham, you know, is getting things ready. There's, there's nothing except Isaac. And Isaac goes and asks his father, and he goes, Father. Uh, and he goes, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> then Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And they both went together. Now, we all know the story. It says that God would provide the lamb. But let me ask you this, those of you who know the Bible, what did God provide that day? The lamb? A ram. That wasn't a mistake in the Bible. God provided a ram for that day and that sacrifice. But that God would provide the lamb was a prophetic message. You see, the word lamb is one who is taken from the flock, called out from the flock. And for the first time in Scripture, the word lamb is used as a sacrifice. And this prophetic message takes us to where we are today and what we're remembering what Christ did for us. You see, he was the lamb that was going to save us and bring us back. And it was only through him that Ab the promise to Abraham could ever be complete and met. It was tied in through the Bible. We can go back to the Psalms. You know, we see in Psalm 22, 7 to 8. And it, it talks about Jesus. You know, a lot of people today, you know, I, I see this on TV or I hear it saying, well, you know, really, did they write this out in the Bible, you know, just to make it look like Jesus came? Did they make this all up? Was this all made up in the Bible? And... I sometimes, you know, and, and maybe this is just me, I find it hard that people would even question it. It actually sounds stupid to me. I have to be that, that blunt. It does. Like, I was talking to somebody and I was saying, do you question the fact that Alexander the Great existed? Do you question the fact that he conquered so much? And everybody will say yes. Yeah, we go to history class and we believe in that. That's not a problem. Yet there are less than 10 ancient manuscripts that talk about Alexander the Great. 10. And the earliest one is 600 years between Alexander's life and when it was recorded. And then we have the Bible with 10,000 copies. Not 10. 10,000 in multiple languages. We even found a copy in the ancient desert. When I was in Israel, I saw the cave where the Dead Sea Scrolls were. And they've been carbon dated to before Christ's cross, Christ's life here on this earth. You may question whether Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You may question whether he died for your sins, but you cannot question that he existed. If you do, then you've got to question all of history. Every book, everything that you've learned from before the printing press is no longer valid. Because there's no other book, no other events in history that have been validated so much, cross-validated. This is not even something that we should question. Jesus Christ died for our sins. There is no question. He is real. He is not a figment of somebody's imagination. He walked on this earth. So I hope that if there are any here who actually question it, just look at the evidence. And if you don't believe the Bible, go and look at the Roman sources, pagans. They talk about Jesus' death. And the Bible actually predicted his death. 
I just mentioned Abraham, Psalm 22, 7 to 8. It says this, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him from his, the, his, from he delights in him. What about Isaiah 53? Do we all know this one? This is the forbidden chapter for a lot of people, especially people of the Jewish and Muslim background. The chapter nobody likes to read. The chapter that exists in the Dead Sea Scrolls that existed, written and recorded before Jesus died on the cross. Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 7 says this, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitted by God, and afflicted but he was pierced pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our inequities upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed all we are like sheep have gone astray we have turned, every one of us, to his own way. That false freedom, that false lie that Satan had given us. And to this day, we still continue. And the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he'd opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, when he went into Jerusalem and the time had come and he'd finished praying all night and they came to get him and he was betrayed. He was betrayed. And all up until that time he knew he knew this was going to happen to him. The agony when he prayed to the Father, but he was there on a mission. And that mission was for you and I. In John 3:16, we all know this verse very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, <laughs> people ask, well, why did it have to be Jesus? Why did it have to be Jesus? This is actually the question that we see in Luke, that actually Jesus replies. Do you remember the rich ruler who came to Jesus on his way to Jerusalem? And he said, he said to the Lord, you know, what must I do to, to, you know, have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, do you follow the commandments? Do you do all these things? He says, yeah, I've done those all. I've done it all. And he goes, well, with one thing you lack. He goes, go sell everything you have and follow me. Do you notice the disciples reply? Then who can be saved? You see, they weren't implying that they were rich. That's not what they were trying to say. They weren't implying that everybody's rich or that everybody has money and that's why. See, they realized in that moment that if they had that same amount of money, they probably would have struggled in the same way. And you see, this admission is actually an admission that we all need to have. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we try and follow Christ's teaching, without Christ, we would be no different than the rich young ruler. 
we wouldn't be willing to give it all up. We wouldn't. And this is why the disciples thought it was impossible for us to be saved. But look at Jesus' reply. It may be impossible for you and I, but for God, nothing's impossible. You see, he was the only one who could do this. The Bible testifies that he was without blemish. You see, when Adam and Eve ate of that tree, the punishment was de- of death was upon them and all of their descendants. And here comes Jesus, takes on flesh. He takes on flesh. He didn't have to. But he knew then that he would have to come down and take on flesh. And he lived a life as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. He lived that entire life. He went through all the struggles that you had to go through. I am sure he experienced all the temptations that this life has. And he even went face to face with Satan in the desert. And not once did Jesus falter. You see, he is the one and only. There is no one like him. Does anyone in this room think that they've led a perfect life? The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of the God. And the, and the reality is that, yes, as we walk with Christ, our lives change because the Holy Spirit starts to work in our life, start to show us there are things about us that cause us to sin, that cause us to go down the road and to do things that we shouldn't. And it's to our own detriment when we don't listen. But even still, even still, we sin. And maybe in our lifetime, it goes from us, you know, sinning like getting drunk, doing things, drugs. Maybe that's a past that you've experienced. Maybe it's hurting people, stealing, theft. And then you become a Christian, and those kind of things sort of start to go away. But then God starts to show us other things. You know, there's unforgiveness in your heart. And yet you never even knew. Oh, and and the way you look at people, that's not right. The way you treat your parents isn't right. How about your neighbor? And as time goes on, he starts to do even more. It's like, you know, we've seen this analogy and heard this analogy in preaching, but it's a beautiful analogy. It's like like the sculptor, right? Breaking away the stones to create the image. And you see, that never ends until the day we go to be with the Lord. But what that is is a testament that we will never be perfect. We can never be perfect. We will make mistakes. And that's exactly what the disciples realized. But it's Jesus who was perfect. All those years, all that temptation, going face to face with Satan, and he was perfect. Perfect. And what did the perfect person have to do? What was that he was called to do? And so on that day in Jerusalem, as he was betrayed in the garden, they took him. And we see this in Luke chapter 22 and verse 63. And it says, now the men who were holding Jesus, and this is after he was taken, and Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. They were holding Jesus in custody and were mocking him as they beat him. Do you remember the Old Testament scriptures that we just read? 
They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. And as we go further in chapter 23, it says, and now this is now Jesus before Herod because he had gone before the council. And the council had found that he should be put to death. So they sent him to Pilate, who had then sent him to Herod. And so here he is, he's questioning him. And he questioned him at length, and he made no answer. Do you remember the scripture that we just read in the Old Testament? The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Then down in verse 18, in the same chapter, as he's sent back to Pilate. And there he is before Pilate, and Pilate doesn't want to crucify Jesus. But all the religious leaders, all of them, wanted him killed. Why? You know why? Because as he walked this earth, he spoke truth that brought freedom. And it wasn't in the way that the Pharisees and the religious leaders thought. It isn't in rules that you follow. It isn't in religious practice. It isn't in coming to church every Sunday. That is not how you achieve salvation. It is not by dressing a certain way when you come to church. It has nothing to do with any of those things. And that is such a threat to them. Such a threat. And so here they are in verse 18. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barnabas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. You see, they rejected the innocent person, the Son of God, who had brought hope, done miracles, and so much more. And they chose a murderer in his place. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? Those prophetic words. What wrong has he done? I have found him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding, and loud cries and they sh- that he should be crucified. And then it says, and their voices prevailed. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate said, fine. And in Scripture we find that he said, this is now on you. This is your judgment, not mine. And so they took Jesus. And they scorned him, they whipped him, the soldiers mocked him. I think many of you have seen the suffering in some of the plays or movies that they show, and some of it's quite graphic. Well, I'll tell you, it's probably even worse than what you've seen. And here is the perfect man Son of God, never, never to have done any evil, even out of Pilate's mouth. (laughs) 
a murderer chosen over him. And that is so prophetic because haven't we all at one point in time hated in our life? And isn't that what Jesus said? If you hate, you have murdered. Verse 23, chapter 23. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you imagine that? You would be suffering so much. You're on that cross and Jesus is asking the Father to forgive them after they had spat on him, ridiculed him. And then at the foot of the cross, they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. <laughs> and the ruler scoffed at him, even when he was on the cross saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Remember the Old Testament scriptures we just read? The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him that said, this is the king of the Jews. And while he was hanging there, one of the criminals were hanging there and, and was railing at him, and the other one said, you know, stop it. Stop rebuking him. Don't you fear God? That other criminal basically said, we deserve this. But Jesus doesn't deserve this. And then Jesus looked over at him and he said, truly, truly, in verse 43, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, when we recognize that we're the ones that actually deserve to be on that cross, not Jesus, when we come to that point in life, when we realize, no, we haven't led a perfect life, and we probably will, stumble in the future. You see, when we come to that admission, just like the disciples with the rich young ruler, when we actually realize no matter how good we are, we're never going to be good enough. Does that mean we should give up? No. Not at all. Because you see, when we come to that admission, and we confess that Jesus Christ was without sin, and he died for your and my sins, that should be our response. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is your response to what he did. And that criminal's response is the response that we need to do, and not just once but remembering that ongoing in our lives. And it says in verse 44, and now about the sixth hour there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus calling out in a loud voice said, and before I read it, listen to this. Here's Jesus on the cross. And all of a sudden, all around, darkness starts to come in. There is darkness. In, in the Gospels, and other Gospels, it talks about the earthquake that came in. Something amazing and yet so ugly was happening at the same time, the irony there. Something was being broken. Something was being torn apart. And then Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. He 
he breathed his last. And what does that mean? You see, death was for you and I. Death was for anyone who had committed sin. And there isn't anyone on this earth who has ever lived or who will ever live again until God comes back and puts an end to this that has not sinned. Think of the best person that you can think of. You know, I grew up Catholic. You think the Pope is perfect? <laughs> Mother Teresa, do you think she was perfect? Not one person. Nobody. Except Jesus. But he suffered the consequence of death. He suffered the consequences of death for you and I. And you see, as soon as that happened, the curse was broken. The curse that we would die for an eternity is no longer over our heads. And so all of a sudden, this freedom that we have today, the freedom to go and do whatever we want, live however we want, is really the change that bind us and keep us to this death that we are to face. And I'm not talking about just the physical death. I'm talking about a worse death, a spiritual death. The second death, as the Bible calls it. But Jesus broke the curse that eliminated that. But like the disciples and like the criminal, we first have to say, we're the ones that deserve the cross, not Christ. And we have to humbly approach the Lord that way. Revelation 1.18 says this, and the living one, it's talking, talking about Jesus, right? I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. You see that? He died on the cross, but he lives forevermore. Because the grave could not hold him. Death and Hades could not keep him. In fact, it, he now controls who goes into, into Hades. Not the enemy, not Satan, but Christ. And he can do that for you as well. Colossians 2, 13 to 15 says this, And you who were dead in your trespasses and your uncircumcision of the flesh, God made alive together with him. You see that? God made alive together with him. Having forgiven us of all our trespasses by what? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Amen. Amen. This is true freedom. The freedom from sin. The freedom from what we have done, what has been done to us. The Bible says that by his stripes we were healed. This is the privilege we have as Christians. But I want to talk to you today. This isn't just about, well, I believe and I came to church. That's not enough. It's not enough that you show up every week. It's not enough that you believe, yeah, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, there needs to be more. Because we had rejected Christ at one point in our life. And now we have to reverse that rejection and accept Christ into our life. This isn't a passive gesture when we become a Christian. Paul in Romans says that if we confess with our mouth 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that he is Lord of your life. He is king of your life. Not you. Not Satan's lie of freedom. But you're putting away your own personal freedom that, that you think that you can be God, that you think that you can be right, that you know what's best. You put that aside and you say, no, I don't believe that anymore. I realize where that got me and where that's going to get me. But now you need to make a confession. And that is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that I have been a sinner. And that I need Christ. Then and only then can what the criminal on the cross experience you can experience. And before we continue today, I want to give anyone here the opportunity to make that decision today. It's an important decision. It's not a decision that's taken lately. You need to make that decision. Jesus was publicly raised on a cross and put to shame. We need to do the same in our confession publicly. Let's bow our heads, please. Everyone bow their heads. And like I said, I want to give anyone here today who has never had the chance Maybe you've gone through the motions in life. Maybe you've gone to church. Maybe you've thought, I'm a good person. I don't do bad things. But as we heard today, that is no guarantee. And guess what? If you think you're a good person, God can make you a great person. And he can forgive you of your sins, of your scars and the hurt that you've, you've had. And so as our heads are bowed, I'm just going to ask you one thing. If you today want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is, this is the time now to make that confession. It is now. Don't wait. I just want you to raise your hand. Just raise it. Everybody's eyes are closed. Just raise your hand where you are. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Yes. Raise your hands. I see that hand. Yes. Yes, I see that hand. Amen. Amen. For those of you that put up your hands, I'm going to pray. And I'd just like you to follow after me, just where you are, silently. You've raised your hand today, all of you, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to make a change and to accept what he did on the cross. So pray after me. Father, today I make the confession that I am a sinner deserving death. But at today, I believe in you and I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he is the Son of God, that he came to this earth, lived among us, and never sinned, and that he loved us so much Father, that you loved us so much that you made a way for me. I confess, Lord, that I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified for my sins. He bore my sins from yesterday, today, and forevermore on that cross. And he broke the curse that was on my life. And Lord, I believe that he rose from the dead glorious. I believe that he is in heaven now. 
And today, Lord, I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Father, forgive me of my sins. Today, I am your child. Teach me your ways. Help me walk in this life the way you want me to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For all of those who put up their hands today, I want you to know something. Mark this day. Mark this date. This is the day that you have been reborn. You have a new life. You are now born again, as we say. And you need to understand that you are forgiven. <laughs> now, now remember this, those of you who accepted the Lord. The Lord has humor. Yes, the cross is gloomy, but salvation is wonderful and beautiful and glorious. And so just remember the squeaky wheel. You all need something to remember and burn in our minds. It doesn't take away from what you did today. In fact, I hope it helps you remember every second what you felt. And you see, I would encourage you just to pray. Seek God. Just seek Him. He loves you so much. And from the very beginning, as we saw, he had a plan. And he has a beautiful place that he's going to create for you and I. And today you have been guaranteed that place. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for your sins. And for all our sins. Now we're going to do something today, and if you've accepted Jesus Christ today, you can partake in this. And you see, on that, that week when Jesus went to die for us, he had what's called the Last Supper. And that night, that was the night before he was to be taken in. And he has last supper with his disciples. And let me read from the same chapter. And then I want to ask Pastor Melody to come and join me and help us distribute the, the emblems. And if I would ask the ushers and, and the deacons to come forth as well. But I'm reading from chapter 22 of Luke. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. You see, this is the promise. Today, for those of you that accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what Jesus is saying here is, this last supper, one day in heaven, all of us, are going to be with him and he is going to put a table before us you will be in heaven where there is no suffering no pain and in verse 17 it says and he took a cup and when he had given thanks and he said take this and divide us amongst yourselves for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, today we talked about the cross. Today you accepted Jesus Christ and what he did for you on that cross. And for all of us who have, this is a reminder for us today. That as he was nailed to that cross, 
and the blood that was shed on that day. It cleanses us from all our sins. You are free. Don't let the sins of the past keep you down. Christians, you are free. There is nothing that can enslave you. Call out to Jesus Christ. We are going to take the bread and the wine, which is in symbolized in a wafer and juice today. And we're going to do this in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. And it's also a foretelling of what we will do with him when we get to heaven. That is our hope.
to hold the wafer and consider the words of Jesus when he says, do this in remembrance of me. Somehow this wafer is to remind us of the wounds that paid our ransom. The scourging, the whipping, the reviling. To know that he, lay, he hung upon that cross with those nails driven through his hands and his feet. That crown pressed upon his head. The spear spoking, poking into his side. And yet we hold only a wafer to remind us of that. If you've ever been beaten or if you've watched a fight, you know the pain. And today as we take this wafer, may we pause and know of the pain that he took for our stead. May we pause and be grateful and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that in my place, you were beaten. Thank you, Jesus, in my place, you were spat upon. Jesus, you were scourged and reviled, beaten beyond recognition. For me, who am I that you were mindful of me? God, I thank you. I thank you that you sent forth your son into this world. That he would be that living sacrifice. Not a ram, but a lamb. Not caught in the thicket, but willfully walking to the cross. Bearing that cross and hanging upon it for our sin. Lord, we thank you today. As you take the bread, would you remember what the Lord did on your behalf and give him a word of thanks in Jesus' name. cup bears a reminder of when he said to the children of Israel that when I see the blood I will pass over you when he sees the blood over your life the blood that his son shed he doesn't see your sin he sees his blood and he passes over that sin why because Leviticus says that the life is in the blood and that blood has made an atonement for your life why because through according to Romans we've been justified by the blood of the lamb and so today when we take this blood we know that in our bodies there flows blood and when my blood flows, there's not an area of my body that that blood does not flow to. And so from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, my body has life flowing blood through it. And I recognize what Jesus did that when he poured out that life blood, when he emptied of himself, it was for my sin body. When he emptied itself, it was for my mind because the blood flows through the mind. When he emptied itself, it was for my heart because my blood flows through the heart. When he emptied himself, it was for every part of me, body, soul, and spirit. And so today as you hold this cup, consider your needs for healing consider your needs for forgiveness of sin consider your needs for your emotion and your mental well-being and say lord as i partake of this as a remembrance of what you did may your healing blood flow through me god 
I thank you. I thank you once again for your son that poured himself out for us. Jesus, I give you praise. Hallelujah. I give you praise and I thank you that God, Lord, you wore that crown. A forever reminder that, Lord, I have peace of mind because of you. I have no fear because of you. Because your perfect peace casts out all fear. I can look to you for all of my needs, emotionally, mentally, physically. Lord, today I can stand here and be justified because of your blood that has been poured out. For your blood that made an atonement for me. Lord, today I could receive healing in my body because by your wounds I am healed. Let us partake of the blood.
without accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't yet, you still have the ability to. Today is a day that you can be liberated. And if you have, you can receive once again the power of Christ working in your life. Now as you leave today, and I will stay back if anyone needs prayer. Please come forward. If you didn't accept Jesus Christ and you want to now, please come forward. If you need healing, please come forward. And I release you now. And may the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.